Hey everyone, uh, my name is Timothy Harris and I'm at Stanford, California with Dr. Stuart Kim. Dr. Stuart Kim is the CEO of Axgen. He is a anti-aging biologist professor at Stanford for over 20 years. So Dr. Kim, I've already introduced you a little bit, but I'd like to ask, who are you and what do you do? I am a scientist and a scientist likes to explore and find out new things. Mm -hmm. I find that to be really interesting and um, fulfilling. So I was a, a basic scientist at Stanford mm -hmm. as a professor in genetics um, for 20 years. And then, as I told you um, before that, um, we came up with a, a guy, came up with a, a guy I had lunch with, came mm -hmm. up with a terrific idea that changed my life. And we had lunch. He told me the idea of doing genetics on athletes. Mm -hmm. And I said, boy, this is a really good idea. And over the years, it got to be a better and better idea until it compelled me to leave my safe, tenured, full professor job at Stanford and try to really go in on this idea so that we could make it happen. And so I left Stanford to start this company called Axgen to, um, to see if we could get this idea to work. So Dr. Kim, what were some of your like doubts that you had first had when moving from that comfortable office in Stanford to starting your own business at Action? Oh man, it was the craziest thing. Okay. I'll tell you what it's like, you know, because you, got, you know what tenure is like. I mean, you can't fail. I mean, they can't fire me. And, um, you know, I have a pretty safe research. I had a nice research career. I was sailing along. I had terrific, terrific uh, students um, uh, in my lab. Uh, so what would make you leave like, you know, something that seemed totally safe and secure? And that's the potential for doing something completely new. I just found that to be so interesting. It's really risky. And, you know, most days I'm just stressing out it's like leaving full tenured position and starting over from scratch to see if you can, you can make it in a, in a new field. Um, so, so it was really scary. It's sort of like if this is the 1400s and being a full tenured professor is like being, you know, uh, nobility in Spain. You got a guy like Christopher Columbus that says, I don't want to be a noble and just live you know, a, the easy life. Mm -hmm. He sailed off on a ship where he could die uh, just to see if he could find something new that's across the horizon. And so, uh, so that's kind of like what it is, is, you know, when I have an opportunity, it's really super risky, but you might see something new. Uh, that's what compelled me to leave Stanford and start up, do this startup. Mm. So what's some advice you have for students or even professors that are afraid to take that next step or afraid to take that risk? Well, it's not obvious that it's a good idea. I mean, you want, you, you know, you, it's, it's being a full professor at Stanford is pretty good, pretty good deal. So, um, you know, it's basically a personality. You know, I'm, I'm an explorer. You know, that's why I started this. That's what a research scientist is, is they want to make change. They want to make discoveries. And I felt like there was a good opportunity to make a really big discovery using this genetic thing for athletes. Mm. Um, and, and I saw more opportunity. You know, my, the future trajectory in aging research was, um, unless there was a big breakthrough that, was, that could happen, I, I didn't see where there was gonna be a game changer. But in um, research on athletes, there was, there was potential for really big game-changing discoveries to be made. So, you know, I'm following, the, I'm following where, there's, um, where there's opportunity. You know, there's a um, metaphor, an allegory on how discoveries are made. You probably heard about this. You could look for, if, if there's a, a coin on the ground, you could look under the street light 
and you'll be able to see all the coins on the ground, except that everybody else has already gone there, probably picked up most of the coins. So it's actually pretty hard to find a new coin under the light. But if you go where there isn't much light, it may be harder to find the coins, but you get more coins that way. So that's what sort of being a research scientist is. You have to decide whether you're going to stay in the main path, but it's already fished out. Um, or go and do what somebody, nobody else has done, where you have an opportunity to go and see something um, and find those coins. And so, you know, I think all of the modern um, day explorers, and I think a lot of them could be research scientists because we're all trying to find something new. And one way to find something new is do something nobody else does. Um, so I told you about Columbus trying to find America. It's also like, you know, whoever found the Grand Canyon, that must have been a just phenomenal thing. You're just walking around in the desert and all of a sudden you come across the Grand Canyon or Lewis and Clark. You know, these guys discovered, made the discoveries and you just say, you know, that's how you do it. And so, you know, all the guys that stayed in Chicago or stayed in Boston and had a nice, comfortable life, they never made the discoveries. And so I really, you know, am driven by trying to make discoveries and I'll go where it has to. But it's not always that sane. I'm sure a lot of guys died trying to discover the West. And so it's not that sane. But if you're, if you're an explorer, that's what you do. So would you rather live a life chasing, chasing something that, that you can't obtain and then die? <laughs> or <laughs> would you rather stay and live a comfortable life just never knowing? No, living a comfortable life isn't for me. I mean, mm. it, I'd like it, but that's not my goal. You know, like, I, that's not, I mean, I have to have a goal. I have to believe that I could potentially change something. Mm. Otherwise, what's the point? So, um, no, just living a comfortable life. Well, having said that, I've always lived a comfortable life. I mean, you know, I, I live at Stanford. Now I can just devote everything to trying to make a change. Mm. Um, if I, you know, if I couldn't pay the rent, yeah, I'd be in a different, different position. But, you know, I feel like all of my material needs are covered. I don't need a fancy car. I don't need, you know, jewelry. Um, I like simple food. I don't need expensive food. I don't, I like these clothes. I don't like fancy clothes. So now I have all the things I want. Now I can devote everything to trying to make change to discover things and try to see if I can change something. So what was the biggest discovery you made in action? So let me tell you the story of action. In the early 2000s, I was a scientist working on aging mm -hmm. and I was on the advisory board of a research institute that focused on aging. Mm -hmm. And during my um, scientific advisory board uh, meeting at, at the Bach, I went and had lunch with the president who was a um, businessman, but I also knew he was an ex pro athlete. Mm -hmm. So he played for the 49ers and the New Orleans Saints. And I said, I just got to meet what a real walk and talking pro athletes like. Mm -hmm. um, he's an amazing guy named Jim Kovach. And during lunch, we were just chit chatting and he, he started talking about athletes. And we came up with the idea of doing genetic testing on athletes. It's a great idea. And so um, I convinced 23andMe to let us test 100 NFL players. So Jim got out and uh, got 100 NFL players to sign up for a little pilot experiment. And we were going to find what is it about the DNA of a pro athlete that made them so big and strong and fast, you know? And Jim was just dying to know, like, why is he like a superior physical specimen and I was interested to know and so uh, we did that we tested a hundred NFL players um, it was a complete failure and so the genetics for human performance really is 
pitiful. Uh, but I did interview a bunch of NFL players and, you know, we found out, you know, the height genes, the genetics for height can explain about this much of your height and the genetics for muscle strength. It's, it's, it's mathematically, it's, it's minuscule. And so I was interviewing, um, starting linemen for the Kansas city chiefs guy is a big, huge mountain of a guy, but his genetics said he should have been five foot six and he had no power, but he had endurance. And I tried to, on the phone call, I said, you know, you don't know this, but you're actually short and you're not very strong. And he said, this is bullshit. And I realized this is bullshit. <laughs> and so we taught it more and more. And then we talked about risk for um, Achilles tendonitis. And there he became super interested. He started explaining what it's like to be a pro athlete. And he said that, you know, the difference between first string and second string is there's not much difference. It's whether the coach likes you or not. In one Achilles tear basically ends it. You're going to be second string or you're going to be cut from the team or you're not going to be a pro athlete the next year because you only have three years to play in the NFL. And he didn't know. He knew exactly how strong he was and how tall he was, but he didn't know where the injuries were going to come from. Was he going to get a knee injury or an Achilles injuries? And when you're talking about big contracts like pro players get and um, the risk of losing it all by an Achilles tear, you know, that really resonated with them. So we switched to uh, doing research on genetic markers for injuries. And then over the next eight years or so, we went from what was known in 2012 and in 2015, we, we increased the, the, the strength of those tests by a million fold. And in 2018, we increased those tests, some of those tests by, you know, another 10,000 fold. So now in 2018, we had tests that, you know, were pretty significant. Mm. So we're talking about a fourfold increased risk for ACL tears, uh, uh, you know, increased risk for concussion. And now for a kind of injury called a stress fracture, which, in, which happens to all athletes, but especially endurance runner, it's incredibly strong tests. Um, and so that's now a reasonable way. Like if you're training for, um, if you're a marathon runner and you're training for your marathon race, or worse, if you're training for your, the Olympics marathon, you only have like one mar Olympic marathon you're going to really compete if you're lucky too, you know, because your, your, your lifetime for being able to win the marathon is short. And if you get something simple like a stress fracture, you're out. And so it's, it's really worthwhile to know if you, if you're at risk for a stress fracture. So that was the idea that changed my life. You know, I was working on aging. I said, you know, we could keep on slogging away of aging. I personally think that there's, you know, we're going to need a, a breakthrough in, in, in science in order to better understand aging. That's a different topic. But now I see a straight and clear path to, um, to benefiting athletes. And so now we're working with Olympic athletes and pro athletes in, in the U S and in England to try to, you know, um, help them train in the preseason so they don't get hurt, which will extend their lives, their, their athletic careers and help them win more games. Everybody wins. The coach is like this because they win more games. The owners like this because they win more games. Players like this because they, they get more gold medals and win more games and get paid more. So, uh, it has potential. So would you agree coming from this perspective? Would you agree that a bodybuilder is a bodybuilder due to hard work or genetics or steroids? No, I think, <laughs> you know, I think everything, everything is part nature and part nurture, right? Mm -hmm. And how much is nature and how much is nurture really depends. Mm -hmm. So I know something there is, there are reasonably strong genetics for muscle strength, but it pales in comparison to going to the gym. So, um, you know, so if you want to get strong, just go to the gym and you could have identical twins and the twin that goes to the gym and the other twin sits on the couch 
there's going to be a big difference in your strength. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know, there are genes for muscle strength. Like Jim, uh, you know, Jim was always going to be stronger than me unless, you know, if we, if we did anything similar. Um, and since he's not only born with bigger strength genes, but he's, he's in the gym a lot, you know, he's definitely stronger than I, I was, I, I've ever been. So, um, but there is a genetic component to muscle strength. So I want to kind of bring the conversation just a bit back to anti-aging, which yeah. is your, your previous work. My previous work. So back home in Florida, we have something in St. Augustine. It's called the Fountain of Youth. Uh -huh. And they say, if you drink from this fountain, uh -huh. you can live forever. Yeah. Legend says it. Legend yeah. says it. Yeah. I don't know if it's happened, but the legend has said it. So what discovery have you made or what transcription factor or <laughs> what could we put inside of a human to maybe even mimic the effects of the fountain of youth? Ah, that's a good question. So let's just get some of the ideas straight. I mean, this is all theoretical. Mm -hmm. So I still maintain that theoretically we could live way long like 200 years, 500 years. The reason I say that is there's a clam uh, called a quahog clam. So um, if you live in New England, you can eat quahog chowder. Those things live 500 years. And so um, you may be eating something that is 500 years old, old in, your, in your clam chowder in Cape Cod. Whales live 200 years. And that's more interesting because it's a mammal and it's big. So big animals are at huge risk for cancer. You know, the more cells you have, the more chance that you're going to get a cancer cell. And they don't get cancer. They can, and they live 200 years. Whereas basically by year 80, you know, human risk for cancer just goes up exponentially. And uh, on the other side, you know, a mouse has um, lives only two years and 80% um, of the time they die from cancer. So why is it that a mouse only lives two years and dies from cancer? We can live 80 years and then you start to get cancer and a whale lives 200 years and in the wild. Um, and, and, and so I would surmise they, they basically don't get cancer in, in, in 80 years. I mean, we're, we're still like middle age. An 80 year old person is just a, it's a middle aged whale, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so that's a potential. And so if we could figure out why a whale lives 200 years, mm -hmm. we could extend our lifespan, uh, very, very, uh, long. Um, now how to do that. Uh, this is a different topic that we going to, we were going to talk about. I think the idea of doing that is not going to be one, one, one switch that can do it. The whole idea that, you know, it's basically a set of pathways, one to one to one, like the, I don't know, your, your ankle bones connected to your shin bone is connected to the knee bone. I think that's not going to explain aging. I think it's very, it, I think it's fundamentally a complex system mm. and you shouldn't think about it. It's, it's a, I think aging might fundamentally be a little bit more like weather or height. And there's no one thing that determines weather. It's like everything compiled. And height, it's clear that your height is mostly genetic, but there it's one million different parts that contribute to your height. And so there is no, except for rare cases where like dwarfs, but for um, my height and your height, it's probably a million different parts of our DNA that are each contributing like a, a, a minuscule amount. And then it's summed up somehow over the entire genome. And um, that determines our height to within a, an inch or two. So I think aging might be a little bit more like height and less like a bunch of switches, like wrinkled peas that Mendel was studying. I think it's much more quantitative. So not a switch, but a complex system. And we don't have the science yet to analyze complex systems. It's hard and we need a, we need a conceptual breakthrough on how to take it apart. So that's my, my hunch about how aging works. Um, 
And that's why I think it's going to be hard to really live like a whale. Um, I don't think there's going to be one change you can make that'll make us live like a whale. And we're going to have to figure out, you know, a different way of approaching the whole, the whole system. So if I wanted to, if this was a life or death situation, yeah. And within the next five years, yeah. somebody comes up to me and says, Hey, you're going to die unless you find an anti-aging treatment. What is the first thing that I should do in order to start developing that therapeutic medicine or perhaps gene therapy? What I would do is uh, 50 years ago, they did an experiment called the parabiosis experiment. Mm -hmm. So they took two mice, an old mouse and a young mouse, and they sewed their circulatory systems together. So they had one shared blood system, old mouse and young mouse. And what they found, and um, it's, it's been reproduced uh, a lot, uh, is that the old mouse got younger and the young mouse started to get older. And the old mouse got younger in all sorts of ways, like the skin got younger, the muscles got younger, everything about the old mouse got better from the young mouse. So that was, um, there was something being transferred to that. It's, it could be, that the old mouse was getting rid of some of the bad things. And it could be the young mouse was giving the old mouse some of the good things. We don't know. Uh, and it's also going back, it might be complex. It might be a thousand things being given from the young mouse to the old mouse. But one way, if I was, if I knew, you know, if I only had five years and I couldn't wait for a complete revolution in science, um, I'd go get a transfusion from a young guy right so transfusions are done all the time millions are done and usually it's from a young person and so i would go get a 20 year old's blood and 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 get a transfusion as many times as i could take you know it's screened it's 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 mostly safe you know and so i think that might have a you know that might have a real beneficial expect it would if i was a mouse i would you know uh, if if uh, I would benefit if I uh, did so, there's this parabiosis or the human vampire experiment. Mm. That's what I would do. I would do the parabiosis experiment. There we go. Parabiosis. That's the answer. Yeah. What made you want to go in the realm of genetics and specifically aging? Has this always been a passion since you were young? No, no. Um, <laughs> aging came out uh, also as a as a just a uh, serendipity so i was a geneticist i was doing something yeah, so in the 90s you know we were able to start studying um the field of genomics was born and the genomics means you don't study one gene at a time you can study all of the genes at once and so you know we could sequence the entire genome we could look at the expression of every gene in the genome and see the entire picture. And until that, like in the 80s, everybody was studying one gene. You would sequence one gene, you would take your favorite gene and see if it goes up and down in cancer or something like that. But in the 90s, we got the technology to look at every gene and see all of the genes, whether they go up or down in cancer. So I was happy doing genomics. And then I met um, a really, um, vanguard of science named Tom Johnson. He was studying aging and we got together and he convinced me that studying aging all genes at once was a good idea. So now I could look at, so the first simple experiment we did is we looked at every gene as a chain from going from a young animal to an old animal. And so this was like a complete um, map of how, um, how your genome changes as, as you got older. And you know that goes back to my the idea of studying aging using many many different factors instead of trying to focus in on one one factor. And so I, my career switched from genomics of 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 stuff of of cell biology to focusing on genomics of aging. Mm -hmm. That's where aging started. Gotcha, gotcha. So so who is one person that? Besides the 49ers NFL player, who's one person when you were towards your younger years, your undergraduate years that really 
inspired you or mentored you or pushed you forward oh, inside so the many. realm of genetics? Yeah, there's so, so many. When I was your age, you know, I was trying to decide what to do. And, you know, I, it was clear that there were big discoveries getting made in um, molecular biology and biology. I was a chemistry and philosophy major in college. I didn't know anything about biology, but I kept on, you know, I had a hunch that there were discoveries to be made. So you see the idea of following where discoveries are made. So I went to graduate school and I met, um, my advisor was Lee Hood, who has also had just terrific vision. Um, and so he was, he's an amazing guy. And um, you just talk to him for three minutes and you just get infused with his energy. And when I started, I, I worked on something called, um, it was in immunology. And what was interesting is back then, we knew that you could make antibodies to almost anything. And so, uh, and it was kind of bizarre. Like if there was a new virus that appeared, never before seen like COVID, um, your antibodies could make an antibody that recognized COVID specifically. Um, and nobody knew how that worked. Like how could you ever have anything that was specifically binding to a new protein you never ever saw. You know, and they discussed theoretically on how that could happen. And there were all sorts of wild and crazy ideas about how that would happen. And so one of the first things Lee told me is he said, in your lifetime, we are never gonna understand how antibody diversity comes to be. And by the time I graduated, we solved it. So uh, as you may know, there's, there's rearranging genes that generate uh, a huge potential for new types of antibodies to be made. And you just start to take the best um, rearrangement that sort of binds to COVID, and then um, it rearranges some more and mutates some more and it refines and it binds to COVID better and better and better. And so virtually nearly anything that attacks us, we can make an antibody to. Um, and I think we pretty much understand how that works. But that was something that was never going to be understood in our lifetimes. We figured it out. That's the rate at which discoveries were made for that. And then you move on. So that's no longer cutting edge. And so, you know, we need to figure out new things to solve. Like I think aging would, we could, I would say aging, we're never going to study in our life, figure out in our lifetime until Lee Hood comes along and then he'll figure it out in, you know, four years. We need to get a breakthrough to figure out, um, the questions with the, at the you know cutting edge. So, so what's your what's your favorite what's your hobbies? Uh, what type of movies do you like? Not so much movie. Well, with the pandemic, I'm sequestered at home. I watch so many movies. I'm sick and tired of movies. I can't get more than ten minutes. You know, just a few minutes into movies, and they all seem the same to me. You know, either they are a sequel or they're like something else. So yeah, uh, hobbies. Uh, you know, I like to stay active. I, I ride a bicycle. Um, I've started um, lifting weights and, and, and trying to do that. Um, Ever thought of having your NFL buddy as your personal trainer? <laughs> <laughs> I know some NFL players. You know, until I met Jim, the best athlete I knew was um, varsity players at a D3 school where I went to college. Um, but now through Jim, I know a bunch of NFL players. Ronnie Lott just emailed me yesterday. They're just remarkable people. You know, they're so interesting to know because they're inspiring. They are so committed to making themselves better. You know, like I walk around and, you know, I try to eat healthy and I try to be active, but it's kind of like just a regular amount. They are dialed in to eating just the best food they can control their weight to within a pound and 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 they can get up every day maybe twice a day and go out and exercise it's an amazing amount of determination to be a, to be an athlete i i wonder sometimes if being a really good athlete is as much mental it's probably more mental than physical like if i could follow their regimen i'd probably be a pretty good athlete just because you know if i was working out two times a day and just controlling what I eat, I'd be a lot healthier. 
but it ain't I ain't I can't do it so um, so they have a they have a kind of uh, mentality that's really remarkable well dr. Kim um, thank you for your interview thank you I appreciate you I, I like this. your insight and uh, and perspective yeah um, thank you